We welcome back RBSEE instructor Christina Curley, known to all simply as CK. In many of her past webinars, CK has gone through many technologies across Web3, the metaverse, IoT, AI, and more. But today is special because today has a twist. CK will be talking not about AI technology, but about the talent that is needed in order to make this technology realize its full impact. As CK will certainly show you, skills are the new currency on the job market, and AI has set ablaze a massive multi-year skills gap and necessitates a reskilling revolution. She will go through the causes and provide strategies galore for companies to become learning leaders and for professionals to start taking charge of their own skilling initiatives. We've got plenty to cover, so I'll hand it over to CK now with our sincere thanks for being uh, here today. CK, please take it away. Thank you, Margaret. You always give the greatest intros and I appreciate it. First off, happy 2024 to everyone. We are already hitting the ground running with my first webinar of 2024 being in the first half of January. You know, Margaret hit on two key things in the intro. First, talking about lifelong learning. You're going to hear me talk about that a lot. But second, I talk about a lot of tech. Heck, mobile, Internet of Things, the metaverse, Web3, AI, AI, AI. But today we need to talk about something that I'm talking a lot more about, and it's that other half of the equation, actually the more important half of the equation, and that has to do not with just talking about tech, but talking about talent. You know, it's so important that I go through what the skills gap is and what the AI reskilling revolution is, how massive it is, What's driving it? I'm going to go through three key drivers. And here's important, whether you're in companies or whether you're an independent professional like myself, I'm going to go through 10 key ways that companies and individuals can really help change and become learning leaders. You know, we talk about tech a lot. And what's important to understand is that we cannot run the businesses of tomorrow, all that great marketing speak, right? with the skills of yesterday. Alternatively, we cannot have all of this tech and all of these gains be realized if our human talent, most important thing, because remember, whether it's AI or any other tech, they're here to serve us, to elevate our roles, to help assist and augment our processes. But we can't have any of those gains individually or collectively as companies if we are not reskilling our human talent. So it's really how one, I am ending all speeches and keynotes and trainings. And two, just in the past 18 months, I've started an entirely new category of trainings because we're not focusing on the humans enough. And with how fast technology is going, especially with AI, I mean, you're seeing it in every hashtag, every headline, every Hollywood movie, it is setting ablaze massive change, but that also widens a skills gap. So let me first start by showing you just how big the change is and understand we're all in this together. This is globally. So how big is the skills mismatch right now? Well, let's look first at all at the percentage of employees that we need to reskill re globally by 2025. Yep, I said 2025, and we're in the first month of 2024. It's up to 50%. Now, luckily, these new technologies, specifically generative AI, are really easy technologies to learn because the new programming language is English. They're very simple. They're very beneficial, but it still takes reskilling really on two fronts. One, understanding the changes, understanding the tools, and two, understanding how that applies to your job. Because the real, real story is not job replacement. It's reskilling. It's how we're reshaping our roles. Percentage of companies currently with skills gap is up to 87%. Easier said, eight out of 10 are already feeling the skills mismatch or skills gap. Here's one, 
average half-life of general skills is five years, and average half-life of technology schools is half of that, pardon me, skills is half of that at two and a half years. This does not mean that the skills we have heretofore, all the knowledge, all the degrees are rendered moot. Not at all. It's a build. What we need to start understanding, especially as our companies and working with those and our clients, is that we need continuous learning and continuous refresh of skills. It's no longer one, two degrees and done. It's building on that knowledge. Here's some other key factors. Jobs disrupted globally by 2025. Disrupted does not mean deleted. It means impacted. It's up to 85 million. And new job roles created globally by 2025, it's right at 97 million. You know, we always get automation wrong. We always think it takes away. But actually, what it does is it creates new. Um, a, a stat that I always like to talk about is for every job the internet took away, it created two new jobs, but we learned those new skills. Heck, in the last 30 years, we learned how to use Google. In the last 15 years, we learned how to use mobile apps. And now in this coming five years, we're going to be learning how to use more and more AI. Percentage of jobs that haven't even been invented yet by 2030, up to 85% which just gives us more reason and rationale to be reskilling constantly. You know, I always say, when you were a kid, did your grandma say to you, you're going to be a great data scientist. You're going to be a wonderful app developer. No, things like SEO, things like mobile apps, things like AI, they weren't in the mainstream yet. So the good thing is that with skills being the new currency of the AI economy, I didn't say degrees, I said skills. We can build on those. We can use those and really lean in as employees of the organization, as well as independent workers and independent freelancers and contractors to get more and more jobs at bigger and bigger salaries. One thing we're finding out with leaning into AI as tech companies overall, tech companies overall, just with digital literacy, not even talking about AI yet, pound for pound, make about 15% more in revenues compared to their peers that are not keeping pace. But when we look at AI, that figure goes to 36% higher. And that's as tech adopters overall, not the tech companies, but any industry that's adopting these tech. The bigger story is what's just come out in the last month, that AI-related jobs are offering a whopping 77% higher salaries than other jobs. So we're finding that it's a really good strategy. No matter our age, I'm 55 in a month and a half. No matter our job roles and no matter our industry, to continue reskilling and follow this lifelong learning path. This is quickly going to need to become the default. So let me go into now that we've gone through how massive the need is, and understand this is globally. We're all in this together, whether we're 55 in a month and a half or whether we're still in college right now about to come out in the next year or two years. We are all in this reskilling climate together. But let me go through now that I've talked about how big the need is and how big the skills gap is and why you should be leaning into reskilling. Let me talk about what the key factors are of this reskilling revolution, because there are three and they're important to understand for foundation. So I'm going to go through three key drivers. Well, first, you can probably guess that with all these new technologies and with quick change quickly becoming our default setting in this wonderful acceleration age, AI is actually accelerating acceleration. Actually, I'm going to say it better. Intelligent technologies, whether it's AI, whether it's robotics, like AI in a shell, whether it's quantum computing we're hearing more and more about, different flavors of automation. I like the way Pedro Domingo said it. He said, AI is the scientific method on steroids. These advancements are increasing. The timelines between major advancements are compressing percentage of tasks, not jobs, that can be automated 
are absolutely increasing and our productivity is skyrocketing. So understand with intelligent technologies, not the same as awareness, no Terminator here, not the same. It's decoupled from consciousness. We're talking about technologies that can what? Acquire and apply skills to achieve an outcome. That's the definition of intelligence. But as our AIs get smarter, we need to get smarter too. So AI is absolutely accelerating acceleration itself. Second, AI really flips the script and all these intelligent technologies on a lot of the changes we've seen before. First, the amount of tasks that can be augmented, can be assisted. And when I say that, when we're driving, GPS assists us. When I'm writing an article, I may use an LLM like ChatGPT or Google Gemini to help me edit. That's an augmentation. But maybe for scheduling, I want to have an AI tool that completely automates that task. But what intelligent technologies like AI do is they increase the amount of tasks that can be automated. A lot of times I'm asked, what will happen to my job? Worry not, we humans are really good at making sure we have a lot of work to do. We'll actually be able to work more at the top of our talents. But AI flips that script. It also impacts all job roles. When we talked about automation in the last 10, 15 years, we've always looked at that for blue collar jobs. Nope, this technology, a major thing about it that is so beneficial, but also so dramatic and such a change is that it impacts all different types of jobs, whether they are blue collar, white collar, or like I like to call new collar. Third, what we're seeing is skills are undergoing seismic shifts. You know, what we do well, the AIs don't do so well. And what we may not do so well and struggle with, the AIs do really well. But what we're finding is that the skills that we need to reskill on, and I'll go through this a little more later, they're not just going to be digital literacy. Like I say, soft skills are back, baby. Being human, adapting, curiosity, questioning, Leadership, like I say, no matter how connected your autonomous car, you still got to tell it where to go. So all these new skills that have actually been very human, the most basic skills are coming back in vogue because now all the jobs that we've been doing that are better off for the robots, now we can work in more human activities and tasks. So we're gonna to need to reskill, not just for digital literacy, but also for human skills. We'll go, we'll go through that later, but this is something really exciting. I say the rise of the robots is not the story, it's the human renaissance, it's the real story. And last, value creation gets turned on its head. You know, I'm asked, oof, CK, when all those AIs pr produce all the answers, what is my value? And what I want to explain here is that our value switches from having just the answers to identifying the program problems and questioning and curiosity. You know, you can't solve a problem until you identify a problem. And critical thinking at its core is really an issue of asking the right questions. In fact, every advancement, discovery, solution and improvement always started with the question. That question was usually why or why not? Questioning is as basic and human as you get. If I have parents watching this right now, you probably remember around 30 to 34 months, the why stage, when kids started asking all the why questions. Why is the sky blue? Why is the ocean cold? Why does it snow during times of the year and not others? My favorite, why does Christmas come but once a year? We are hardwired to be curious and questioning. And we've gone from raising our hands from questions to raising our hands only with the answers. So it's going to be critical that value creation gets turned on its head, which is really very exciting. You know, before I go to the final key driver of this section, I do want to launch a poll because I'd like to take a bit of a temperature check with y'all and see where your organizations or yourselves are with reskilling. So if I can ask my trusty mate, Margaret, to load our, our first poll, that would be wonderful. 
that poll should be appearing. Oh, it's definitely appearing. I'm seeing lots of responses come in. Excellent. Okay, let me see. I have oh. to go to my other computer. What's happening in your organization? Is your org prioritizing training and reskilling with AI in mind? A, nope, not at all. 24%. You're not alone. You need to send them to this webinar. It's going to be, we're recording it. It'll be ready in a couple of weeks. Maybe a little bit, 35%. Definitely some. Ooh, I'm impressed. And absolutely a ton. Wowza, meowza, I'd like to hear about that. Folks, it's going to be not just for learning and development and training to take on. We're going to need to be advocates as well. You know what I say? This is a good one. We invest in R&D, right? We invest in research and development. Yet what do we say with learning and develop, development. We say we spend on training. We spend on L&D. Yet all corporations will say, and I believe the majority mean it, that their humans, their employees are their biggest asset. So we need to look at this as, a, as an investment. And second, you need to tell them, hey, employees are not as easily updated as apps. We need continuous learning to make sure that you can be increasing your revenues as well as we're making sure for our own that we are investing in ourselves. And I'm going to go through some ways to look at reskilling and making that a priority in your own life. Because I'm telling you, leaning into this is not just a payoff, but it's a payoff quickly. It doesn't take years to realize that investment in education. It can be within a handful of months. So Margaret, thank you so much for that. So now we've gone through two of the three key drivers. We've talked about how intelligent technologies, most notably AI, is accelerating the very pace of acceleration. And we've talked about how intelligent technologies, most notably AI, flip the script. The third key driver, this is a whopper. We are not just looking at a skills mismatch. We are also looking at a talent crisis. So let me do really well at explaining the difference. The best way in is to say, what happens when you have billions and billions and billions of AIs? What becomes really precious? Humans. Humans become more precious. I like to call up a uh, historic detail. In the Industrial Revolution in the 50s, when we found a way to create gabillions, for lack of a more scientific word, of widgets for pennies on the dollar, what went up in price and up in value? Handmade goods. What we're finding right now is we don't just have a skills gap. We also have a talent crisis in that we cannot create humans fast enough. So I say the future of work is very much the future of workers. Why? There are a variety of factors between aging populations, between low birth rates, and we're lucky here in the U.S., we have strong birth rates. But in Japan and other countries, the birth rates have just plummeted. It's, it's actually really heart-wrenching to see. So we're having to get better and better at what automation can handle because humans are too precious. We need to put their minds and their emotional intelligence on the right tasks. But we have um, resignations and actually retirements that happened as a result of the pandemic. Lack of diversity and inclusion. I'll go through this as a key strategy. We need to be much more diverse in our skilling and our hiring talent. And this may actually be a boon because of this. Geographic mismatch, whether you're in a rural area and the jobs are in the city, or maybe it's spread out globally. Heck, the only country that will have a talent surplus by 2030, it's not China, India. Folks, this is a global, global issue. There are policy factors and there's a widening skills gap. This is how big it is. 85 million unfilled jobs by 2030. We're going to need to get much better at skilling much more percentage of the population to take on much more of these human roles. And I'm going to put this in perspective. 85 million is the population, about 2 million more, of Germany. 
the second largest country in Europe after Russia, 85 million. And it's not like we're just going to, bam, arrive at 2030 and have this issue. Like I said before, eight out of 10 companies are already struggling to find the talent with the right skills. And we have 78% of companies that are currently understaffed, and it becomes a potential $8.5 trillion problem of unrealized revenue. So we're going to need to get really good at reskilling all generations. This is not an older generations versus younger generations. Not at all. More parts of the world and more flexible with it. So we don't just have a skills gap and a skills mismatch. We actually have a talent crisis too. You know, one could look at this and say people with the right skills are going to be able to write their own ticket for the next 10 years. So take this, actually probably 20, take this as massive incentive to make sure your company is skilling, but also yourself, okay? Tell this to your kids too. So the big question is, okay, CK, I, I know how massive this issue is. I know how important it is. And I know the key drivers. What can we do about it? And that's what I want to go through in this next section. Which changes are needed in order to meet this historic moment and to better become learning leaders? So I want to go through 10 key changes, and I want to explain that these are important for companies overall and professionals you know, individually. So this is something we can take on ourselves. So I want to go through 10 key changes here. The first is for companies to understand. I, I say in, in my um, profession, I tend to argue a lot, not in mean ways, not in aggressive ways, but to build a business argument. Chief among them, when it comes to the AI reskilling revolution, the skills mismatch and the talent crisis, is I tell companies, we need to understand that skills equal competitive strategy. You know, we talk about change management. Reskilling is change management. We also talk about digital transformation. Two things on digital transformation. One, verb, not noun. You don't arrive at a destination of digital transformation because all these new technologies are accelerating and they're accelerating further. So it's ongoing learning. But what change management and digital transformation should have always been about is people first, products after. We need to change those mindsets and skill sets and then absolutely revamp your business models, your brands, your processes, all of that. So we need to prioritize skills as core to business strategy. Just like I said before, we don't just invest in R&D, we also invest in L&D, learning and development. This is an issue of relevance. You know, I say technology is always the tool. Reinvention is always a strategy. You may see behind me here the words invent. This is my own personal motto. Invent, reinvent, repeat, that ongoing learning. We need to understand this means reinvention is strategy, technology is tools. The goal is always and forever relevance. But relevance is a fast moving and quick moving target. So this is what else I say to companies, managing the turnover of your employees, making sure they're skilled will be the new normal and as and an equivalent to keeping loyal customers. Yep. So managing staff, keeping turnover rates low is as important as keeping your customers because skills, it's the new strategy, baby. So the new role, the new role is really that employers, if we're talking about continuous learning, lifelong learning, ongoing skills, refresh, reinvent, employers become the new educators and they need to step up because a lot of employers will say to me, CK, where am I going to find all of this AI talent? And I go, I'm going to tell you a secret inside your own organization. I just went through talent crisis. We don't have enough humans to go around. We need to look at our talent pools and continually transform them. Now take a breath. I am not at all saying it's in addition to all you're doing through the day. In fact, as much as AI can improve productivity, 
what it takes away from us. It gives back to us in time. And that time needs to be, I'll call it O-O-J-T, ongoing on-the-job training. It's not finite in time. It is invent, reinvent, repeat. And that means that we need to create structures like learning boards. A lot of our companies have communication excellence and marketing excellence and data excellence. We need to have learning and learning advisory boards and those types of centers that really support this. So employers, they're becoming the new educators. And that means our culture changes. I like saying it like this. We go from know-it-all, this expertise, to learn it all. Because we need to become much more curious cultures. Understand this. A culture is not what a company makes. The culture is the people, priorities, and values that make up that company. But curiosity needs to be core. Like I said earlier with questions, if AIs are going to help us with all the answers, we need to come up with the right questions. And we're working with these AIs. A lot of times the way I like to describe AI, it's not doing what we're doing better, faster, cheaper, easier. It's doing unlike us. Put it this way, alternative intelligence. So it has an intelligence that's very different than ours, but symbiotic. And we need to practice relentless reinvention. You know, I have been reinventing for almost 30 years. And I do that around technologies. I'm now doing that around talent as well. And I don't do it just because I love learning. I do love learning. I'm a big geek like that, loud and proud. It's survival for me. And it's been survival for me. I have a lot of folks ask me, why aren't you writing more books, CK? You've got smart things to say. And I say, thank you. But we have finite precious resources of time and attention. And while I may spend 50% of my time teaching, the other 50% with acceleration being accelerated, I need to not write what I know. I need to learn what I don't know, or then I won't be of value to you. And I won't be able to ensure my own livelihood. So we need to go to curious cultures and skill sets. This is a beautiful part of the AI reskilling revolution. We have entirely new skill sets that we're gonna be looking at. Sure, we're gonna need digital literacy. Tech skills will be non-negotiable and just like we go to Google today, which will find such friction so fast with having to go and search for information rather than going to an LLM and being able to type in and get the information we need targeted, we will need those digital literacy skills without question but now they get balanced. I just saw some, some new stats in the last six months that say we have gone from the last 15 years of the top 10 skills needed, all being STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, to now being more soft skills. I actually don't like the word soft skills. I've heard it say portable skills or power skills, but now adaptability. When an AI is accelerating acceleration, the number one skill is going to be adaptability, curiosity, critical thinking, leadership, collaboration, emotional intelligence. So we're going to need to, this is so odd, we're going to need to start teaching humans how to be human again, because we've been so lopsided on all just STEM. Now we're going to, I guess you could call it STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. And another big thing, not enough folks are talking about, CK's talking about it, write this one down, learning agility. Agile is an amazing software methodology. We get certified in it, right? We need to talk about learning agility. It's not just what to learn. It's how to learn more quickly and effectively. I posit we need to start teaching learning agility and how best to figure out how for your own personality type, for your own learning type, to learn more quickly and to reinforce those lessons. We need to start doing that as early as first grade because I posit this digital renaissance, this age of acceleration isn't stopping anytime soon. And we're going to need structures and scaffolding to be able to support that. And lastly, human-machine collaboration. You know, we've gone from working 
on machines as business enablers, we're now working with these intelligent machines as coworkers, as colleagues, heck, as collaborators. But we need to understand to what level they can help us in our roles now and how our roles will evolve in three key ways. How can they assist us? Like I said earlier, how does GPS assist you while driving? How does it? How do Excel spreadsheets help you during tax season or augment? Uh, mostly, what I'm finding with generative AI is they augment my work processes where I now have a built-in editor. It's not set it and forget it, but it's a helpful coworker that collaborates with me and helps to augment processes. And some activities, some activities are much better automated fully so that I can free up my schedule to do more of the work at the top of my talents. This is a big thing. We get so many headlines, so much news, uh, so much polarizing information about how AI is going to replace everything. Nope. The real AI job story is reskilling. And the bigger story on the future of work, 5% of professions overall may go away, like with every automation era. But what it really does, it changes how we work. Hey, we're doing an online webinar right now, and the work will do. And every time we go through an automated revolution, we get to being more human and getting to be better at the top of our talents because AIs cannot replace that. They work with us. So skill sets are undergoing massive transformations. I love this one. Modernize learning programs. We need to look at individualized learning pathways. Here's an example. 100% of the employees take 50% of the same courses, classes, and trainings. But then let employees, let colleagues individualize their learning pathway. I want to go to this conference. I love this podcast. And then share back the results. And actually, it's not just train the trainers. It's learners teaching learners. And we may go from full creators of training programs to curating as well as creating. Here's a great one. When folks ask, how can I work in a multi-generational workforce? Pair older and younger generations. Make sure they're not working in the same department. The older generations can teach the younger generations about institutional knowledge and industry facts. And the younger generation can then exchange and share information, say, on new technologies. It is a fair and complementary exchange of ideas. And get really creative, whether it's online certificates on-site training, videos, podcasts, but let's modernize these programs. We have a whole new challenge. It's going to take a new approach to solve it. And like I say, this is too big an impact and too big an issue. We're going to need a bigger boat. We're going to need ecosystems. What does that mean? It can't just be the company. Company is going to need, companies, pardon me, are going to need to partner with training companies, with educational institutions. I think half the work we do at RBSEE is not just having our students come to us, but us going to different companies and delivering those programs. Industry associations, even companies themselves are going to need to form coalitions. Folks, you see all the online certificates. You also see the webinars. You see that IBM and Google have come out with free courses around AI. Heck, those companies are now looking at skill certificates with as much weight as they're looking at degrees. Again, they don't cancel one another out, they build, right? Even companies and government policies will need to change to put more funding into this reskilling. Re you know, there's never been a time of more change. We know that, right? But there's never been a time when we know this change is coming. And the answer is not panic. The answer is preparation. The answer is not trying to save the old, it's to prepare, and reskill for the new so that our industries are still strong, our citizens are still strong, entire countries stay strong and stay superpower. So we need to cultivate ecosystems, think in ecosystems. This is probably my favorite because this is where I'm going to be putting a lot more of my pro bono time. We need to finally tap untapped assets. You know, 
sometimes we get, and it's for most of us, it is not intentional at all, but we get tunnel vision and we say, how are we going to solve this problem with the finite resources we have? These resources are not finite. We are overlooking entire populations, whether it's minorities, people with differing abilities, veterans, older workers, refugees, citizens in developing markets. We are going to need to tap, reskill, and respect these otherwise untapped markets heretofore, because it's not just a skills gap with the amount of employees and the amount of talent we have now, it's also a talent crisis. So I'm really hoping a lot of good comes out with this specific strategy because we are going to need to do this. And along with this, this may be music to some folks' ears, we need to get a lot more flexible and a lot more fluid when it comes to the battles that we're picking. Right now, I get it. Companies need employees on site. They may not need them full time on site, but they need, need them for part of the time, right? But it seems like so much energy is being spent on that when I'm going, well, you may win that battle, but you'll lose the bigger war of being flexible because we're going to need a bigger boat. We're going to need more talent assets. We're going to need more employees. We need to be more flexible with where workers are located whether they're in rural areas, a developing market, or in the city itself that the company is in. We need to get a lot more flexible and a lot less of a paternalistic approach. It's becoming a buyer's market for employees. We also need to be much more fluid. Some employees will be full-time. Some employees will be independent contractors. Some will be between the two. But we're going to need that in our approaches our policies with companies, and even our policies with governments, because we're going to need a better approach when it comes to immigrating workforces and working with external workforces, because trust me, there's going to be enough work to go around because we have this mounting talent crisis and we have this reskilling. So worker flexibility and fluidity is really important. And we're going to need to look at, like I say here, invent, reinvent, repeat. It's not just once a year. It's ongoing. It's throughout the day. I'm using AI tools right now to quiz me because I'm not an AI. I have to learn knowledge and then I have to reinforce it. So I'm using it daily as a way to quiz myself because reskilling is a commitment, like I said, to relevance because tools are the tech, right? Our strategy is reinvention. Relevance is always the goal. So we're reskilling, we're reinforcing, we're refreshing, and we're repeating. And a big one here that I remember, especially because Satya Nadella, the CEO and chairman of Microsoft, his book is called Refresh. When he came into Microsoft in 2013, that company was facing a major downfall. It was spiraling into obsolescence and he flipped that approach to continuous learning. And as a result, that company has not only been on the rise, that company continues to refresh itself. So it's whether it's in technology, strategy, or reskilling. So it's important to understand that whether it's a new world company or it's a traditional company that's having to refresh, this entire methodology of reskilling, reinforcing, and repeating needs to become core, just like that curious culture. And 10, this is a big one. Reskilling is your new marketing. How? We're not just looking for a paycheck. We're not just looking for some purpose. We're also looking to, in our jobs, in our roles, continue to improve our net worth. So a lot of companies, the way their marketing is, how they provide ongoing reskilling or that ongoing on-the-job training. Retraining is the best way to retain. You know, I know we talked a lot about uh, the resignations that happened in the pandemic, and then we had the layoffs. Now we're talking about retaining those assets. Heck, in manufacturing, an amazing industry that I'm doing work in, we're looking at an overall problem of 2 million jobs that need to be filled. 
So we are already finding this in industries. Heck, look at nursing. Nurses are going to Capitol Hill right now saying we are overtaxed, overtired, and we are putting our patients and our own selves at risk because we don't have enough folks in our profession. They've even started, stopped some nursing programs for a couple of years because they cannot take care of the demand. So you're going to see a lot of reskilling there and a lot of innovation, but also rebranding. The value proposition is not just what we do for the customer, but how we value our own employees. Remember, we don't just invest in R&D, we need to invest in L&D. Remember, employees aren't as easily updated as apps. And when it comes to independent contractors like myself, I need you to look at this. Actually, everyone can do this, full-time employees as well. One, look at what your employer or yourself is doing to reskill you. Two, look at time that you can spend each month on taking an online certificate, taking these webinars, listening to audiobooks. Take and look at what you can appropriate for dedicated time, but then look at what I call shared time. For example, if you're commuting to work, listen to your favorite podcast and get ready for your day. But on the way back, use that time to listen to an audiobook. When you're unloading the dishwasher, listen to audiobooks. When you're at the gym, but we can find, heck, Netflix, Prime, Apple TV, they're all getting great documentaries around all these technologies. So take a little bit of that time that you'd otherwise watch your guilty pleasure. Still watch that. It's important for relaxation, but look at how you can better use your time. Because again, leaning into these technologies is only going to make your career go further, faster, and at an accelerated pace. So reskilling is definitely the new marketing. But to maintain relevance for companies overall, for industries, heck, for countries, we are going to need to invest as much in talent as in tech because these tech are magnific magnificent. They're magical. They're amazing. But we need humans that understand how best to use the tech to improve the net worth of our companies. And we cannot operate. We absolutely positively cannot operate the enterprise of tomorrow with yesterday's talent. So it's in everyone's best interest. I believe we might have one more poll. So I wanna ask my mate, Margaret, if she will load the next poll. I just loaded that poll. We should uh, see, everyone should see that okay, on their gonna like. screen. What are your plans? Nice. And it's a great time to plan. You know, they say that New Year's resolution by this time or the 15th, they've already been like rendered moot. They're not. This is this is the new year, the new you. We can do this through certificate programs. We can do this with focus. So what will reskilling be a priority for you this year? Without a doubt. Very nice. Maybe understood. Only if I have to. I get it. I get it. Um, the nice thing about only if I have to or possibly is how our companies can start integrating this, not as an additional. I'm actually asking companies right now when they say, what are your recommendations? I say, take a deep breath, at least one day a month. One day a month, allow employees, promote, encourage employees to be reskilling, but we also need to integrate it into our day. And we need to make sure and look at these intelligent technologies and what can be assisted, augmented, and automated so that employees, professionals have the time for that. <clears throat> I'm now going to bring us to less of me telling you and hopefully you asking me. And I want to see, have we had any questions challenges have we information had any questions oh my goodness have we all right i'm Bring gonna uh, 
dive hmm. right in um, because uh, there are quite quite a few. And I will reiterate something that I said at the beginning, which is if we don't get to your question live during our allocated time today, we will take the question, CK and I, and uh, create a bonus video recording of our responses uh, to, to these other questions. So, we don't leave you hanging. We don't leave you hanging. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Without becoming a programmer, what mm -hmm. job titles will we be mm -hmm. looking at that are AI skill heavy? I love this question. Actually, all we, we do not look to, you can become a programmer, but we're going to need less of programming and more of the jobs we're already in and evolving them using these tools. That's why it's so important for us to take this skilling to understand, ah, these are tools that I don't have to code. Heck, we're not even calling them low code anymore. We're calling them no code. I can create an app just by telling chat GPT with my voice or typing what I want. What's important is in our organizations, in our current professions, learning how to use these AI tools to help assist us with jobs, to augment our activities and to automate some workflows. So you don't have, you can start a whole new career, but we won't need that. We're going to need to learn how to reshape our current professions. That's a great question. Thank you for that one. That's an important one. So um, I'm scrolling through because I knew that, oh, here was um, one person said, um, why don't you take all of your webinar transcripts and let AI write your book? Actually, I have been asked that and I may do that. I'm thinking I might do, thank you for that. I'm thinking I might do a video book along with that, but I like that, especially now that AIs are getting much smarter to like learn kind of the way we phrase and the way we, we write. So I will take that action point on and let you know. All right, the next question, and uh, Christy is going to have to weigh in if I'm getting this wrong, because I'm combining two things that she um, sent that I yes, think she meant to be one big question. Okay. What education and jobs are going to be available in, uh, in uh, sorry, I couldn't say that, in AI yes. for professionals looking to change jobs? Oh, gracious. Um, a ton. And the reason I say that is because the reskilling need um, is so massive and because just in the last year, oh my gosh. Uh, so when Margaret, when I started reskilling uh, 12 years ago at Rutgers and we were talking about the digital, digital technologies of like web 2.0, we were one of the only kids on the block. Like I remember the New York times was interviewing them and saying how interesting this mini MBA and all of this. It is amazing just how many individual skilling from uh, the tech companies themselves, from universities, from companies, from coalitions are out there for um, different costs. Some can be free, some um, can be in the hundreds or thousands. So there is just so much available in so many different formats. And I mean, online versus on per in person. But the amount of jobs, we need to look at this in a way of which industry or industries did mobile impact 100%. And it disrupted them in different ways because there's so much disruption, which is not a bad word. It just means it changes it. It just fear and loathing around that word. We're going to be reshaping all of our careers around this. In Hong Kong, their subway system, which has a 99% on time rate, I'm like, why not to say 100%, but in 99%, they use AIs to assist their engineers but their CIO says our engineers are too precious. They need to use these AIs, but I'm moving them up in roles, not down and not um, replacing those industries. So I just want to make sure I have her question correct, because there are going to be so many reskilling options. It's whether it's a priority from the company and a priority from the professional themselves, but it's going to impact every job role. And just like I said earlier about programming, it's not just programming, it's how it's going to work with your job to make you and your company more money. That's want to make sure I'm answering her question because her two questions were good. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to just make a quick um, announcement that I can tell some things are coming into the chat, but chat doesn't save the same way that the um, Q&A does. That's why I've been um, sending you messages throughout. Please put that in Q&A. So I don't want to miss anyone's question. If you ask something and it's only appearing in the chat, I don't want to lose it. Please um, drop it into the, the Q&A box. All right, so next question. Um, you used the phrase um, citizens in developing markets mm -hmm. and um, Jacenia wants to know um, what that means. Oh, absolutely. So we talk about, and I don't like the way we say it actually, um, we talked about the developed world and the developing market. So the developed world, um, those uh, countries um, in Europe, in America, parts of South America, but there are a lot of emerging or developing markets, which means they are making huge strides, which are on the rise. Those include India, China would already be a developed market, um, Brazil, parts of Russia, Indonesia. These are all developing markets that because of this technology, and I'm talking these technologies in the past 25 years, have been able to make incredible gains. So we, you'll see a lot of wording around developing markets because they are coming up in their revenues, in their sophistication, and their technologies. So India, oh gracious, uh, Pakistan, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, so Taiwan, these are developing markets. Technically, a great economist said that everyone should be a developing market because it's just like innovation. We shouldn't just stop, but it's just old wor wording we still use. My point here is that we're talking about another 2 billion, maybe even 2.6 billion folks that we have not um, given the same amount of opportunities or we haven't calculated into, this is amazing talent. And yet India, which is still considered um, a developing market, is just crushing us with amazing leaps and bounds on digital talent and the like. So that's what's known as developing markets. They're just newer and they're emerging or they're getting more sophisticated. They may not be totally new, but they're um, getting more sophisticated. But we're going to need to look at more citizens as well as across all these different groups that I was talking about, those with disabilities, veterans, older populations, you know, women, all of this um, in this new skilling, because we don't just have a reskilling skills mismatch. We also have that talent crisis. It's a great question. So this question is about small business. Ooh. How would AI impact um, small business culture? What cautions would you have for a small business owner in favor of AI or against it? So I am such a small business that I'm actually a nano business. My entire business is right here in this chair. Um, so a small business can be, oh gosh, anything up to, I think like 20 million. So it's a, a huge gap governmentally um, definitions there. For small business, um, like any other businesses, we only, we don't have machine learning problems. We have constraint problems. We only are able to bring on so many employees and we only have so much budget and we want to continue to grow. So I'm going to say um, the caution is not to just say AI is going to solve all those problems. Nope. But the big benefit is, is that it's almost like we got a lot of really smart interns or even smart um, entry level workers that can assist all of our existing resources. That's one. And two, and the most important part is not the rise of the robots. It's the human renaissance. It frees up our employees. They're still going to work full time, but it frees them up to work at the top of their talents more of the time. Folks, just the amount of time we spend scheduling every year can equate to between one week and three weeks. We're finding that paperwork that's not having us work at the top of our talents is bogging down our managers to the point that they're spending 60% of their time on administrative and only 10%, 10% on innovation in a time of mass acceleration. So for small businesses, heck for big businesses, 
and nano business, it can help us get more time working at the top of our talents. And it's like we're bringing on an employee, right? That can do a lot of tasks for a little amount. One thing beautiful about these tools is not only they don't require a huge learning curve, they're not huge expensive. I don't have a million dollar budget. I wish I did, right? But we can use these tools for under a hundred dollars a month. Of course, that increases the more you're using them. For, so for small businesses, this is a good thing. But for small businesses that want to continue to evolve and continue to grow, maybe not your amount of staff, but your revenues, reskilling very much applies to us as well. I love that. Go small. Okay. So given the time, I would like yes, to make some closing remarks and uh, reassure the 22 or so people who still have questions um, that we will address them. One of the questions actually is where are the questions? And um, just to avoid any Zoom bombing for the person who uh, asked that, um, the way that the Q&A works is that I see the questions until they're answered or dismissed um, uh, so that oh. I would not um, post any question or share any question that might have offensive language or things like that. So I hope uh. that clarifies. Now we're that, that puts us down to 21 questions. <laughs> but thank you, uh, CK. Thank you so much for your time and always enlightening us to the fast-paced changes taking place as a result of AI. And in this case, how to prepare for future jobs and careers involving AI. Um, thanks also to our audience for their enthusiastic participation in our, our polls chat, and especially in Q&A. Um, and I just want to mention that RBS webinars take place on Fridays at noon Eastern. And for more information, you can visit our webpage, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. Don't anyone worry about having recorded that themselves because we share that information with everyone who has registered. Wow. Um, you know, we'll always let you know about, about the upcoming schedule. Um, yes. But we do have our schedule and topics um, and presenters lined up based on suggestions from our audience. So we encourage everyone to keep sharing their great ideas with us. And um, if you stay online for just a moment longer when uh, we end today's webinar, you'll immediately see a very brief three question survey about today's event. And one is a free form field to type in subjects and or speakers you'd like to have featured in, in future web webinars. And finally, as I mentioned when our webinar began earlier, a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and email to everyone, everyone who registered. Um, it will also be on the Business Insights page of our website, along with the recordings of previous virtual Lunch and Learns. So CK, thank you, our audience, thank you, and I wish everyone a great rest of your day. Thank Bye, you everyone. so much. And we'll see you with the questions answered and the recording in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.